This is the 47th video supplement for CIS 351, Grand Valley State University's course on computer organization and assembly language. This video discusses a cache's block size. The previous video explains the fundamental operation of a direct map cache. This cache will work as presented, but it's inefficient in two key ways. First, it has a very large overhead. The cache shown is a one megabyte cache. That means it can store one megabyte of data. That one megabyte, however, does not include the tag or the valid bits that the cache must also store. Those are overhead. In some sense, you can think of them as like sales tax. The problem is that there's a lot of overhead here. Each cache line has eight bits of data, but 13 bits of overhead. Remember that caches are built using a very expensive type of memory called SRAM. This cache is using more SRAM for overhead than it is for storing data. To be precise, it has an overhead of 163%. That's like reserving a $100 hotel room and then being handed a bill for $263. Now, just like taxes, we can't completely get rid of the overhead, but we would certainly like it to be smaller. The second problem is that we rarely want to access only one byte of RAM at a time. Suppose that instead of load byte, we were to issue a load word for address ABCD1234. That means we want bytes ABCD1234 through ABCD1237. We don't want to make four separate one byte requests to memory. That'd be like going to the store for flour, and then as soon as you get home, having to turn around and go back for sugar, and then getting home and finding out you need butter, and then getting home again and finding out you need eggs. Just as it makes more sense to shop for several items at once, it also makes sense to retrieve data from RAM in large blocks. It turns out that retrieving data in large blocks also reduces overhead. Notice what happens after we fetch all four bytes of data for this word. Because the bytes are adjacent in memory, their tags are identical. Since we're going to access these four bytes together, it doesn't make sense for them to each store a separate tag. That's part of what's making the overhead so large. This is why cache lines almost always contain more than one byte of data. This diagram shows a cache with a four byte block. Each line contains four bytes of data. I suspect that the first thing you noticed about this cache is that it's shorter and wider than the previous example. Both caches have one megabyte of data, but the previous example was tall and skinny. It was only one byte wide and one million bytes tall. If we keep the cache the same size, but make each line wider, then we'll necessarily have fewer lines. In this case, we have two to the 20 bytes in the cache divided by four bytes per line, which gives two to the 18 lines in the cache. Now notice how the units cancel, just like they do in like a chemistry class. Verifying the cancellation of the units can be a helpful way of sanity checking your test answers. So since we now only have two to the 18 lines, notice that the index has shrunk from 20 bits down to 18. These two bits are replaced by an offset that tells us which of the four columns contain the specific byte requested. This change immediately makes a big improvement in performance. Bringing in four bytes at a time allows us to reduce our trips to RAM by about 75%. And our overhead is also much smaller. We increase the amount of data per line to 32 bits, but the overhead remains the same at 13 bits. This brings our overhead down from 163% to 41%. And we can do even better. We don't have to limit our block size to one word. For example, consider a function with local integer variables x, y, z, and w. Most programming languages place local variables together on the stack. This means that they'll be placed in consecutive lines of our cache. Pause the video and look carefully at this diagram. Notice how the addresses for x, y, z, and w are split into index, offset, and tag. Also notice that they have the same tag and think carefully about why. Finally, notice how the 18-bit index and the 2-bit offset cause the variables to end up next to each other in the cache. Noticing and understanding these seemingly minor details is the key to really understanding how cache works and what makes it work well. Now this configuration with a 4-byte block isn't bad, but we can do better. First, the 41% overhead rate still seems a bit steep. You wouldn't want to pay a 41% sales tax, would you? Also, we're still making more trips to RAM than is necessary. With this configuration, each initial access to a local variable requires a trip to RAM, which for this function would be four trips. It seems like we should be able to plan better than that. 
x, y, z, and w are all local variables for the same function. Once we request one of these variables, we're almost certain that we'll need the others fairly soon. Making separate requests for these variables feels a lot like making separate trips to the store for flour, sugar, eggs, and butter. So what if we make the block size 16 bytes? The most obvious change is again that the cache gets wider but shorter. Specifically, we still have a cache with 2 to the 20 bytes, but now there's 2 to the 4 bytes per row, which means we only have 2 to the 16 rows. So how does that help us? Well, with the 4-byte blocks and the resulting 18-bit index, x, y, z, and w were assigned to different rows in the cache. Notice, however, that although all four indexes are different, the differences between them are all contained in the last two bits. This is important because when we switch to a 16-byte block, which decreases the index to 16 bits and increases the offset to 4 bits, those differences are now all contained in the offset, and all four variables have the same index, which means they're all placed on the same row, just at different offsets in that row. At this point, you may be wondering, since there are four different variables on this cache line, how do we get the specific word or byte that the load instruction is requesting? That's what the offset's for. Specifically, the offset bits specify which word or byte in a cache line should be returned. This diagram here uses the most significant bits of the offset to select an entire word, which is what you need to do for like a load word instruction. We could additionally use the last two bits of the offset to select a specific byte out of that word to satisfy a load byte instruction. A larger block size not only helps reduce cache misses with respect to local variables, but it also helps when accessing larger data structures. Consider this code that loops through an array of characters. If we had one byte blocks, each array access would result in a cache miss because that cache miss would only bring in the specific character that was requested. Increasing to four byte blocks would mean that only every fourth access is a miss. Accessing byte zero would bring in the other three bytes in the block, which means the next three iterations of the loop, which access array one, array two, and array three will be hits. Now in general for this loop, as the block size increases, the miss rate will decrease. So if increasing the block size both reduces overhead and miss rate, why not make the block as large as possible? To see where this goes wrong, let's begin by taking the idea to its absurd extreme, which would be a cache consisting of a single really, really long line. Every address in this cache would have to have the same tag, which reduces flexibility to the point of harming performance. In fact, we don't even have to go to this extreme to see a potential problem with a large block size. Let's go back to our four byte block. Suppose we have a method that accesses both a local variable x, which is placed on the stack at address 7FFFFFFC, and a global variable g that happens to be placed in the static data section at address 100FFFF0. When the cache has a four byte block, these two variables have different indexes and so they can be placed in the cache at the same time. But if we increase the block size to 16, the index shrinks to 16 bits. And when it does, the addresses of x and g end up with the same index. Therefore, they can't both be in the cache at the same time. x wants to go here in the cache and g wants to go here, but they can't. Even though they're not competing for the exact same spots in the cache, they both can't be on the same cache line because they have different tags. In this case, the 16-byte block harms performance because if we assume the function references both x and g frequently, many of those references will be cache misses. In fact, if the method happens to alternate references to x and g, then those references will all be cache misses because each reference to x will be a miss that kicks out g, and then each subsequent access to g will be a miss that kicks out x. This behavior of repeatedly kicking stuff out of the cache is called thrashing. So what do we do? We obviously don't want absurdly long blocks, but 16-byte blocks seems more helpful than harmful. It turns out that each program has a different optimal block size depending on its particular data access pattern. But for most programs, that optimum is somewhere between 16 and 128 bytes. When you design a CPU, you just have to pick a value that works well for most of the programs you expect to run on that machine. But you should still wonder, 
Is there a way to get the benefits of a long block size while avoiding some of these costs? And actually there is, and we'll see how in a future video.